good? Yeah. I don't know. How are you? Jesus, that was a Yeah, we'll talk about that. Let's get into it. First jump course. It's finally time. I ended up signing up for this course eight months beforehand. I tried ordering my base gear the same time that I signed up for the course so that by the time my base gear was finished being manufactured, I would have it and you know, be able to practice packing on it, have it ready for the course and be able to jump it. There's like a four to six month delay on getting base gear. So I was hoping I would get it beforehand through different complications, you know, COVID and different kind of strains that have been put on manufacturing. I ended up not getting all of my gear. I got my canopy, which was completed early enough. And then Apex was actually cool enough to loan me a loaner rig. Uh, so it was basically my canopy hooked up to to a container that fit it, fit me, and then they loaned me a 42 inch pilot shoe, which was super cool. Going through Snake River, they actually provide you with a practice packing rig. So you can practice packing, you can go through and basically pack your rig multiple times so that when you get to the bridge, you know, you're able to pack quicker and you're able to jump your own pack job. So you're probably like, why, why the hell are you going to Idaho in the middle of winter? Is this Stupid. The reason most base gorges are in Twin Falls, Idaho is Twin Falls has the Prime Bridge, which is basically the safest legal object you can jump in the United States. It's about 486 feet tall. It's about 5.5 seconds to impact. And you know, all the base jumpers, they're trying to protect it and make sure that it stays legal, you know, as long as they can. So set this up, took a flight from Phoenix to Salt Lake, ended up running into two of the dudes that are taking the course with me, Chris and Josh. Chris was a first time base jumper. Josh was actually getting back there to audit the course for a second time. He had done it previously, so it was really cool to kind of get his take on it his second time around. When we're in the airport, ended up finding out that our flight's delayed, it's overbooked, and they start asking for volunteers to hop off the flight and find alternate means to get to the destination. I'm gonna have past Devin kind of talk about this a little bit because you know he was there right after the fact so we're sitting there chatting it up getting to know each other and then uh people at the ticket counter start asking for volunteers to hop off the flight because it was overbooked one of the dudes ended up getting on the flight already he was one of the first people to hear because they asked some of the passengers if some of them would you know be willing to volunteer and get off the flight naturally you know they offered vouchers so one of the dude the dude that was on the plane texted me he's like yo they're giving out 800 dollars for anybody who wants to hop off the plane and they're looking for three people so i'm like me be on the plane other dudes sitting there chilling I'm like, that's three people. So we're like, yeah, me, dude, let's, why don't we try and rent a car and drive? So we look up how far it is, like three hours from uh, Salt Lake City to Twin Falls. We look up car rentals, it's like 80 bucks. So we're like, yo, three hours. We still get to course check-in before five o'clock. This time it's like noon in Salt Lake. Car rentals, like 80 bucks. So we still make out, you know, with like almost, you know, 700 something bucks and beautiful car ride all the way through. So we're like, okay, yeah, let's do it. Flight was delayed two or three times while we're at the airport because of this. We get in the car, set it up, start driving. We're on the road for like an hour and a half and we get two or three you know, notifications from there telling us that the flight was delayed another time, another time, you know. So that's literally like two and a half, three hours after the initial departure time. We get to Twin Falls by like 4.30. I pick up my rig from the hostel that I had to send to. Um, we go over to the base academy and then we get a notification saying that the flight just landed like 45 minutes after we had gotten into Twin Falls. So we got to the base course, check in right before, you know, we needed to do right on time. Did everything we needed to do. Made out like bandits essentially by the vouchers they sent us. We still beat the plane into Twin Falls. We check in, we pack a few rigs. We get a layout of the entire classroom, which is pretty cool. We had uh, two instructors for this course for the whole time. Time we were there. The owner, Tom Ayala, was the main instructor, and we also had Jacob, both really just dope dudes. Really learned a lot from both of them. And he basically briefs us on what we can expect over the next few days going through the course. All the time we're gonna spend in the classroom, going over different material, all the jumps we're gonna do in the coming days. So after we go over all the course material, we pack all of our rigs, you know, we pack about five rigs. I think the students pack two or three, and then the instructors pack the rest. Literally carrying five base rigs to jump tomorrow. We go over the course structure for the coming days, the jump progression. Then we head over to a local climbing gym. We harness up, set up a rig so that we can practice exit body position for the very next day. Everybody gets a turn. Basically each person goes until they kind of lock in their exit body position and they know what they're doing. That first night definitely was got pretty intense. Um, Tom actually has you uh, write a death note or a will to your family, you know, just it both, it doubles as a waiver, you know, to release him of any liability for teaching us. And it also doubles as, you know, in the event something bad happens, it can definitely give your family and friends some comfort. That was actually pretty tough for me to, you know, go through. And that night, was, I probably got maybe like two hours of sleep. I was actually fully thinking on pulling out of the course, you know, I was like, you know, maybe I'm not ready for this. Maybe I need more time to, you know, get my skills up as a skydiver. I need more time to really think if this is worth it. But by the time of the next day, after I got a little bit of sleep in, you know, just a few hours, um, I felt better, I felt ready, felt confident. And by the time I made that first jump, 
I was good to go. So it's uh, first jumps today. Mixed emotions for sure. A little nervous. Excited. Mostly worried about the cold. It's gonna be fucking cold. But I came prepared, so. So that first day, wake up super early. I think we got to the bridge by like 8 a.m. or so. Sitting in our cars, waiting, trying to stay warm. It's like eight degrees the time we're there. I mean, it's so freaking cold. I wore literally everything that I had and I was still cold. I had hand warmers, I had feet warmers. I was mostly toasty for a good period of time, but like the moment I stepped out, I'm freezing my ass off. Everybody gets there, we all gear up, get ready. Tom kind of gives us the lowdown of what he's gonna be doing. So the first jump was a PCA, which is a pilot shoot assist. So the instructor's holding your bridle, which connects to your canopy to your pilot chute. So as you jump off the railing, their hand is essentially pulling the pin out of the closing loop from your rig and pulling your canopy directly out of the packing tray. So it's, you know, the quickest opening immediately when you jump off the railing. The second jump that we did was a student PCA, where we basically PCA'd one another. Each of us got a chance to hold a bridle, and each of us got a chance to, you know, be the PCA. -y. All right, we did that instructor PCA, then we did the student PCA, and then before our third jump, Josh came back up and did his second jump. So he's like, I'm gonna do a TARD. He's done it before. He's done both the fundamentals course and the object avoidance course, both through Snake River. So he knew what he was doing in some regard. Um, it's definitely been a while for him, so I don't hold it to him at all. Um, but this is how that turned out. Am I good? Yeah. I don't know. Sorry, you. Jesus, that was a terrible That was a terrible TARD. <laughs> <was awesome. laughs> Tom and Jacob kill me. <laughs> Just tell it exactly like it is. Uh, Josh was cool about it. He know he, he know he messed up. Um, he's done it before. <laughs> Even later, Tom said that's exactly not how I taught him to do a tart. <laughs> but you know that's how you learn. It could have gotten a lot worse. Basically, Josh said how he felt the fabric of his tail brush against his face. It's definitely we don't want to happen. Had the fabric gotten caught lower, or he had he gotten stuck in it, basically he would have towed that all the way down to the ground. It could have ended a lot worse. So, in spite of all things, not the worst TARD, but definitely not the best. The third jump we did was handheld. On a handheld, you're holding your pilot chute directly in your hand, taking as long of a delay time as you want. For this one, we did basically a go and throw. We hopped off the railing, immediately threw it, and waited for a deployment. On this third jump, I did it super wonky. I had my pilot chute in my hand, and I was trying to hold onto the railing with one hand. I didn't want to use two, because I was a little nervous that my pilot chute would get hooked on the railing. So I tried to just hold on with one hand and balance it. This was kind of messing up my balance. I was putting a ton of weight on my left leg as I was holding on. So when I exited off, it loaded my body incorrectly. And you see that here. All right, so then we all do handheld again for our fourth jump. Everyone's making good progression, doing pretty good. You know, this is, I think, a set delay, if I remember right, or one or two second delay. This one was a little better. I was paying more attention to basically sticking on and, you know, loading correctly off of my one leg. I was still adamant that I didn't want to hold on two arms. At this point, you know, I was like, ah, maybe I should switch to holding on the railing with both hands. My body weight's evenly distributed, but I was kind of determined to try and get that exit right, holding on one-handed, and did a little bit better on that uh, fourth jump. So then on the fifth jump, Tom has us basically switch hands and throw the pilot chute with our non-dominant hand. And this is useful in a lot of cases if you're jumping an object and the wind is blowing in a non-favorable direction. Ideally, you want to be throwing the pilot chute downwind of you so the wind catches it and doesn't blow it back at you so you don't catch it and then tow it into the ground. So, I mean, if you're, the wind's blowing left to right, you'd throw right-handed. If it's blowing right to left, you'd throw left-handed. I mean, in windy conditions. You know, you want to be able to use either hand in the event that you need to. Even to this day, I'll switch hands depending on the wind. Even if it's just mildly different where it might not matter, I still like to just have it and have it so that I can use it if I need to. So let's see what happens on this jump when I switch to my left hand and hold on the railing with my right hand, one-handed again. So yeah, my weight's on my right leg, and as I push off, my right shoulder goes down low and it just throws me into almost a 90 right. Here's another angle of that. 
yeah, almost directly at 90, right? I ended up switching to two-handed later because I was just over looking like I didn't know what I was doing even though I didn't know what I was doing. Basically, each time after we landed, we had to hike out roughly a mile. There's another way out that's a little bit quicker that you can do during the summer, but during the winter months, it's probably more dangerous hiking out during the winter than it is actually jumping off the bridge. We'd land, hike a mile out, and then they'd pick us up in the van, we'd throw all our gear in there, and then we'd go back over to the bridge, re-rig up, and then go back down, do it all over again. So. It's definitely tiring. I mean, over the course of the whole day, we probably hiked, you know, five or six miles. Definitely wears you out. Literally the craziest experience of my life. Five base jumps in, Brian Bridge. Going back to the classroom now for school. I feel like it would have been more scary if it didn't seem so surreal. It's like my brain can't process that I would jump off from a bridge. That made it easier. So after all the jumping, we bring all the gear back to the class, you know, warm up a bit, have some coffee. We go over each person's jumps, all five of the jumps that we did that day, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. We basically just kind of fine tune what we're doing wrong. Obviously, I had a lot that we had to go over. Day three. So we started off the day going handheld on our very first jump. This was to kind of warm us up back into things and work on everything we had been doing the day prior. We could take a delay time, I think, as long as we wanted to. This is where I actually got rid of trying to hold onto the rail one-handed, and I switched to two, and it tremendously helped my exit body position. After this jump, we hiked out, got picked up, got rigged up for our second jump, and got ready to do our first stowed jump. Stowed is where the pilot chute is completely packed, right in the BOC in the bottom of the container. And you're essentially hopping off, tossing your pilot chute to full bridle extension, into clean air and then you're getting it to basically inflate and then pull out your canopy. It's probably important to mention that as we're going through these different jumps, we're slowly progressing into longer and longer delay times. We started with the PCA where our canopy is basically deployed after we've fallen about 15, 20 feet or so. When we go handheld, depending on the delay time, usually our canopy is at full inflation between, you know, 30 feet, um, sometimes upwards of like 50, 60 feet. When we go stowed, it takes a lot longer because we don't have the pilot chute, you know, ready in our hand, ready to go into clean air. It's tucked away in the bottom of the container. So when we throw the pilot chute out, it's got to get to full extension on the bridle, it's got to inflate, and then it's got to have the pull force to basically pull out the pin in your canopy. So before we even did these stow jumps, the day before and even right before the jump, we actually practiced our pilot chute tosses. Seeing skydivers, all of us, we, you know, tended to have some pretty bad habits in how we threw our pilot chute, myself included. So essentially what a good pilot chute toss looks like is throwing your pilot chute out from the bottom of the container to where it gets to full bridle extension. And the pilot chute doesn't rotate or flip in any direction so that the bridle has a chance to wrap around it and slow its inflation. So you wanna get it to full bridle extension, get into clean air, and then get the pull force enough to pull your pin out and then your canopy out. Let me tell you, when you hop off and you do this for the first time, it you count every second going by. It feels like an eternity for your canopy to fully inflate after you've thrown a pilot chute. Super sweet angle from the bottom too, seeing people jump off. You can tell the depth and how high the bridge actually is. So I tried getting a few videos after I landed with my freezing hands holding my phone. Not even sure if I'm holding it because I can't feel anything. Got a sweet video of Berman here. Yeah, dude. On this second jump, we had a self-nominated delay time. We basically told Tom how long of a delay we we're gonna take and then we tried to hit that. I think I did like one or two seconds. Or no, I said one or two seconds and then I ended up taking a two second delay and I think I got it pretty close on this one. And then uh, Jacob decided to go handheld. Jacob only does handheld. He's had, I think, only handheld for the last 700 jumps he's done because Jacob likes to be safe. And if you can take a longer delay time, get more separation, take it deep for safety. Uh, so here you see him take it actually really deep, which is pretty cool. For the fourth jump, we all did a group solo. Basically, we all went out to the edge of the bridge at the exit point, and the instructors stayed on the side, and they filmed us from the side. You get a pretty cool angle here, because you can see how far we're falling, and you get a good reference. Everybody did pretty good on this. We all just took our own delay time, figured out what we wanted to do. I remember I think I went last for like nearly every jump towards the end of this day. Um, that's really cool. So it's a little weird being on exit point by yourself. Feels like there's more pressure in some regard, but it's also weird going first too. All around, it was pretty cool to kind of get the experience of going in different orders. That way you're kind of used to that because that's how it's going to be when you're going to objects in your area. So then we went back to the school after we were done jumping. We went over how to set up static lines, uh, more course material on wind. I think we covered wind like two or three days in a row, which is a really important thing. You know, how wind can affect different objects, when you should jump objects, when you shouldn't, and just kind of best forms of practice if there is going to be wind and you're going to be jumping objects. We went 
went through and constructed tailgates. Tom and Jacob showed us how to finger trap different line and show us how to, you know, form the stuff. They had uh, sewing machines there because Jacob is a certified rigger. So we had a bar tack machine. Basically finger trap the line so that it doesn't come apart and then you tack it so that it stays there for good. So later that night, we went over some course material that was probably the most important that we went over the entirety of the course. First thing being base ethics and kind of how you want to approach base jumping from like a moral standpoint or an ethical standpoint. This is kind of just preparing yourself so that you're not burning objects so that you don't shed a bad light on the base community and you allow other jumpers to jump the same objects. We get a lot of examples of people that did this incorrectly and it definitely helps kind of make you be aware of how to approach, you know, base jumping and not to exploit it for your own personal benefit. You want to be able to give back to the sport and not just take from it, which is I think a really good mentality to have going into, you know, a lot of different things. The other thing was kind of the carnage that we went over. Tom definitely helped instill a sense of uh, severity that base jumping has. You know, he showed us a lot of videos and kind of escalating progression of, you know, minor sprained ankles to some dude who actually broke his feet off to people actually dying. And this is something that definitely helps you, you know, think about and understand what you could be in for if you don't do things right. You don't think through every single jump as, you know, being potentially fatal at any point in time. Day four. On the fourth day, we started off with a night jump. We got to the bridge before the sun rose. It was freezing this day as well. I mean, every day it was freezing, but today it was definitely extra cold and felt extra cold because there was no sun out. I actually elected to pick up this fluorescent pink rig so that it was easier to see me if I landed on the river and I was floating away. Hypothermic. At least there was a traffic cone floating by, you know. We all got geared up. Um, we all had radios so that we could, you know, let them know if we had to land off. I think Chris elected to go first, which, you know, Props to you, Chris, because everybody was a little bit shook on going first. First person they got down basically had the obligation of letting the instructors know that everybody else landed okay. Everybody could do whatever they wanted. They could go stow, they could do PCA, they could go handheld. I went handheld here just so I could have more time to kind of see the landing in the event that I had an off heading opening. By the time we were hiking out, the sun started rising and we could see a little bit better, but it was really cool. I mean, one of the reasons they have you do night jumps is most jumps that are not legal that you're gonna be doing are gonna be at night because during the nighttime, people aren't gonna see you as easily, people aren't awake, and you'll just get less confrontation from people people if you're doing different objects at night. For the second jump of the day, we all did a group solo. So this is where every person went out to the edge of the bridge, uh, to the exit point by themselves without anybody else there. I mean, this is a good thing to have because you're probably gonna be jumping a lot of objects by yourself in a lot of regards. We could do whatever we wanted on these. Stowed, you could go handheld. Um, on this one, I decided to go handheld. I just wanted to get in the habit of going handheld because most of the objects in uh, the area here in Arizona are pretty much going throws or they're handheld. Uh, everybody did great on this jump. We all landed, hiked back out, and then the wind started picking up quite a bit. So we weren't sure if we we're gonna be able to do uh, the static line, which was gonna be the next jump. And you're technically not supposed to rig up static lines to the railing of the bridge itself. So they have a grandma walker in, in the academy that they bring out and you rig it up to that. And then basically that'll pull your canopy out when you jump off. It started getting way colder this day. I think this was the coldest day that we had. Here's past Devin talking about that exactly. I just hopped off the bridge and my eyelashes are frozen. Oh yeah, Mr. Jester. Jester's pretty much famous in the base community. He's lived in Idaho for a long time. There's a video of him in the past. I think it's at Bigsby Bridge in California where there's a basically a sheriff telling him not to base jump off this cliff. And he's already set up. He has his canopy rolled over in front of him. He's heading up to do a rollover where you have your canopy out already and you just front flip over it and it's immediately deployed. I um, think he ended up getting, you know, in trouble for that later, but he's been come to known as the bum that lives under the bridge and base jumps. He talks a thousand miles a minute, but he's actually got a lot of knowledge in base jumping. I mean, the dude has thousands of base jumps. By myself. Fuck. <laughs> good shit, man. Good <laughs> There's probably at least top five of people in Twin Falls as far as base jump numbers go. Um, he rode along with us for the day, uh, kind of hung out, chilled, added, you know, maybe unnecessary commentary here and there, but so made the experience memorable. So for the third jump, instead of doing the static line, we ended up doing the floater, which you're on the opposite side of the bridge and you're facing the bridge itself. And then you just hop off backwards and you wanna hop off with head high, but you don't wanna you know, drop your head down. I went through and did this and I just stayed straight up in a sit, which is not the best thing to do. Um, bridle could have easily gotten caught around my hand, done something stupid, but worked out okay. I was basically set up in a free fly sit and canopy opened, I was good. Uh, wind was we're picking up, so a lot of us were worried that we we're gonna end up, you know, going around the opposite direction in the event of an off-heading. Speaking of an off-heading, Fish decided to get PCA'd off of this, and he had an off-heading, which is really uncommon for PCAs. Typically, they have really good on-heading performance. You have the bridle pulled directly out of your container. Fish has a ton of experience skydiving, um, paragliding, paramotoring, so he was able to turn that around real quick and then land back over. Not a single person landed in the water. I mean, this time of year, you don't want to land in the water. It's like 38 degrees, so you can get hypothermic really quick. So everybody did great on that. Uh, 
Uh, we're supposed to do our fourth jump, but again, the winds, even on that last jump, picked up quite a bit, so we didn't actually get to the static line. We ended up going back to the school and just going over the rest of the material that we had to. Day five. So a lot of us weren't leaving until later this day, um, so we decided to go back to the academy, get some rigs, and try to make a jump so we could make up the jump we didn't do the day before. I think we all just did kind of whatever. We ended up meeting one of the local dudes there as well, uh, John, who came out with us and he was testing out his new canopy and stuff. So we all just kind of did whatever we wanted. I think I went handheld on this. So everybody ended up getting a total of 13 jumps in the entire course that we're there. Cool guys, well thanks for watching, you know? Hope this video can help prepare you for your base jumping course if you are signing up for one. And kinda just how much training and knowledge goes into base jumping beyond what you see on YouTube and in videos. If you have any questions, definitely leave a comment below and I'll answer anything I can. I am very inexperienced into this sport, so I'm not gonna know a whole lot, but I can point you in the right direction to people who will. See you guys in the next video.